I want to remind you of a couple of things this morning. It, again, please hope you're reading our email newsletter that comes out on Friday called The Pilgrimage. And also, please be referring online. You can find a copy of our bulletin that has, we've got lots of exciting things happening in the life of our church uh, in the coming week. So our Share Faith Open House, the building will be open for you to walk through uh, next Saturday uh, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. So come and bring your family and tour the inside of the building. Think of it as a soft opening. The building won't be entirely complete, particularly on the outside, until mid-November. And at that point in time, we will have a building dedication and we will have a celebration. We need to have some celebration in the midst of... Uh, 2020, and we will do that um, in the uh, mid-November. But come get a tour of the inside next Saturday. Uh, Also, that morning, we're having a church work day. We need lots of help to get things situated uh, on Saturday morning. And so if you're available, you can go to our website. You can see a link where you can sign up to come help us. Uh, And then also, you can uh, go to our website and sign up there as well. Next Sunday, we've had this scheduled for many months. It's our Fall Mission Sunday, and so it'll be a big Sunday uh, as well next Sunday morning. We're having Urban Hope uh, Community Church, which is one of our sister churches in Fairfield and one of our ministry partners. They will be leading us in worship, and their pastor, uh, Alton Hardy, will be preaching. Their staff will be in our kingdom communities at 945, and they will be talking about their ministry, and we'll have an opportunity to ask them questions and hear and see how God's at work in Fairfield. Uh, So with that note, next week, we are starting back in our regular worship times. Because of COVID, it's been a little off. Next week, we will return to 815 service and 945 Sunday school or kingdom communities, and then 11 o'clock service next Sunday morning. I know that's a lot of announcements, but Take a look at that. Lots of fun and exciting things happening that I wanted to make you aware of. We've been in a study this fall through the book of Revelation. And so if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Revelation or copy of God's Word. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Before I read, let me remind you, we need to remember, we've been talking about this a few times over the course of the last several weeks But God, through the Apostle John, is pulling back the curtain on the spiritual world and he's showing us heavenly realities in the forms of pictures and images. Remember, Revelation's not giving us any new truth, but it is giving us truth in a new and fresh way. In order that truth, and the truth that we see here might stick with us, jar us, and change us. And this morning, we are going to read a very jarring passage. I think you'll see what I mean. In Revelation chapter 12, this is the word of the Lord. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and the head and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child who, was, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman flies into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. And they were conquered and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. I told you this was jarring. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away in the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. This is the word of the Lord. We pray and ask God to help us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, please come make this passage clear. There's a lot going on. And our tendency is to be overwhelmed by all of the pictures and images. So would you give grace to me? Help me to explain this clearly, but also uh, apply this. Apply this to each and every heart. Jar us, change us, convict us, but also give us comfort. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ignaz Semmelweis was a physician in the 1860s. He was a surgeon and obstetrician, so he delivered babies. And one thing he couldn't understand was why the infant mortality rate was so high. He couldn't understand why so many babies were dying at childbirth. And so he came up with this radical theory. And the theory was this. Before delivering babies, surgeons should wash their hands. And the other surgeons in Europe at the time, you can imagine, were terribly offended by his thought and his theory. They could not believe that he would be saying that they carried a disease that was probably uh, causing infant mortality. They were so offended that they kicked him out of the medical community and he spent his last days in an asylum. Years later, a man by the name of Louis Pasteur confirmed the existence of germs. You see, up until then, babies were dying because they had an enemy that no one knew existed. And I tell you that story this morning because we live in a day, friends, in which people are dying spiritually People are being attacked and tormented by an enemy that most of us doesn't think exists. You see, some of you this morning are so wildly confused by how your life is going. And wildly confused at your constant failure to resist temptation when it comes. And we keep trying to come up with natural explanations for it. Oh, it's because I don't read my Bible enough. Or it's because I don't have enough self-discipline. That's it. Revelation chapter 12 says that behind our experience, there is a war going on. There is a cosmic war. You have an enemy, friends, and it's not an impersonal force. It is a personality that is dead set on your misery. And John calls him the devil, Satan. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, The devil, devil prowls around you like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. His intent is to make you supremely unhappy. He mocks your pain. 
He laughs at you when you weep. He wants to rip your family and your marriage apart. And he wants to destroy your friendships and your relationships. He despises that you are even here this morning listening to this sermon about the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory. Revelation chapter 12 pulls back the curtain. And it shows us the heavenly war so that we might better understand our experience in this world and what we see and so that we might better understand the experience that we feel in our life. And so let's look at this spiritual war under three headings. First, let's look at the opponents. Secondly, let's look at the nature of the war. So the opponents of the war, the nature of the war, and lastly, the tactics or the weapons of the war. Let's look at number one, the opponents. So who's at war? I think to really get this passage, we've got to identify some people. The woman, the child, and the dragon. Who are they? Let's look at them. We'll do this briefly. The woman, look at verse one. A great sign appeared, and it says she was clothed with the sun. The moon was under her feet and 12 stars on her head. Notice she's described as a sign. What is a sign? Well, a sign, by definition, points to something else. A sign represents a greater reality. And so who does the woman represent? Well, the language, remember, these images are not taken out of a vacuum. We've talked about this in Revelation. They're pulled from the Old Testament, taken from Genesis chapter 37, uh, which we see the language is used to describe Israel In Genesis chapter 37, scholars agree that this woman represents the people of God in the Old and New Testament. In other words, she's an image of us, an image of the church, the child. Verse 5, notice the child is not a sign. He's the real thing. He's the real deal. And it says that he will rule over the nations of the earth with the rod of iron. Again, taken from Psalm chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm. And a messianic psalm just means the psalm is about Jesus. And so who is the child? The child is Jesus. The woman is the church. The child is Jesus. Who's the dragon? Well, it's really clear because John throws us a bone here. But look at verse 3. We're told that the dragon is a sign. So There's not a little red dragon that's going to pop out of the sky and come and eat your children. It's a sign. It represents something else. What does it represent? Verse 9, again, John throws us a bone. He's the devil. The dragon is the devil and Satan. And notice the dragon is red, which represents blood and death. He has seven... uh, uh, Seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. We can boil all that down to say that this dragon, Satan, has immense power and strength and influence. But notice, the devil is not all-powerful. We need to make that clear. And we see that in verse 4. He sweeps away a third of the stars. Impressive power to be sure, but hardly comprehensive. The biblical worldview is not that there is a God and an equally powerful anti-God. No, God is the creator. He's the creator of all things. And everyone and everything else is a creature, including Satan himself. The Bible teaches that the God, that God and the devil are not equal powers. Only God is all powerful. Only God is all-knowing. Only the one true God is all-present. And let's pause a second. Because some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, Jason, come on. It's 2020. And you might find all of this talk this morning about the devil simply crazy. And some of you might even find it laughable. Who talks about the devil? Well, you need to know that if you're going to consider Christianity and the Christian faith, you must wrestle with the Bible's teaching on this subject. Because the Bible presents the devil as someone who is not mythic, but someone who is real, living, and a thinking being. 
Jesus believed in the devil. Just read the Gospels and read about his life. He considered the devil to be a rational being. Remember C.S. Lewis's uh, great book, The Screwtape Letters? He says there are, either, there are two opposite errors that we can fall into when it comes to demons and devils. On the one hand, we can be obsessed with demons and devils and think that they're lurking behind every corner and we can live all of our lives in fear. Or we can fall in the opposite extreme, which is to be naive and to think that there's no devil at all. And I would say our struggle in our culture is the latter. It's been said that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he did not exist and doesn't exist. And if that is true, then we have been mindlessly duped by that trick in Over the Mountain Birmingham. Friends, Revelation, remember, it's teaching us things are not as they seem. There is more going on than we can see with our eyes. And this passage is saying, and here's application one, There's more going on than what we can see, and we need to resist the urge to always reduce everything in our lives to natural explanations. We're really quick to say, my roommate's the enemy. That's who the enemy is. Or it's my spouse. Or it's my my parents. Or my coworker. Friends, your war is not against Ephesians chapter 6. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities of darkness, the darkness of evil in heavenly places. Secondly, the nature of the war. Look at verses 4 through 5. So we need to ask this question. Why does the dragon want to kill the child so badly, waiting for the child to be born so that he can devour it? Well, the dragon hates the child. Who's the child? Jesus. Satan hates Jesus. And we need to understand that this conflict between the dragon and the child, we need to understand that it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And so we've got to understand this conflict to really understand the Bible. And John tips us off, look at verse 9, the ancient serpent. John wants to take us immediately and connect us with the Garden of Eden where the serpent first shows up. Genesis chapter 3, 15, God says to the serpent, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he, meaning Jesus, will crush your head. And so why does Satan hate the child? Because the child is Jesus, the promised seed that is coming into the world to kill him. That's why Satan wants to devour the child and wants to keep the child from even being born at all. And think about the Gospels. When you get to the early pages of the New Testament, the promised seed Jesus is born. And what happens immediately when the promised seed Jesus is born and comes into the world? People want to kill him. Remember King Herod? Wanted him dead. Jesus starts his earthly ministry. Satan takes him to the wilderness in order to tempt him. And the religious leader wanted to kill and want to kill and to destroy his ministry. And they finally take him to a cross and they nail him there. And the beauty of the gospel. It's that on that cross, Jesus takes the devil's strategy and actually uses it against him so that Jesus can rescue the people of God and give them eternal life. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, defeating the ultimate enemy of sin and death. Verse 5, look at verse 5. The child Jesus is called up to God, to his throne, where he now rules the nations with a rod of iron. Jesus is king. Jesus wins, and Satan is defeated. Verses 7 through 12. Let me just mention this briefly. It's the same event told and given to us from a heavenly perspective. And the result, did you notice, is the exact same. Over and over, I love this. 
over and over five times, did you notice the word the dragon was thrown down? Look at it, verse 9, 10, 13, thrown down, thrown down, thrown down. It's as if John is relishing in the fact of announcing the good news that the dragon has been thrown down. The word literally means bounced. The dragon has been bounced, dethroned, bounced out of the throne room. And if you're tracking, you're thinking with me right now, okay, if that is true, that's wonderful, but why are things so bad then? Well, Satan is dethroned, but he has not been destroyed yet. Verse 12 indicates that Satan believes in the proclamation. He knows that Jesus is coming back and is going to rid the world in his second coming of complete evil. Look at verse 12. He knows his time is short. And because he knows his time is short, he's on a desperate rampage, unleashing whatever evil he has left. He's like any great tyrant. Even though he's defeated, he will not go down. He's going to keep swinging to his final breath. He refuses to give up. In other words, we could say it this way, the suffering in the world and what you see is not a sign of Satan's victory. It's actually a realization of his defeat. He refuses to go quietly. The battle is won, but the enemy will not surrender until the battle rages on. And so what does that mean for us this morning? Look at verse 17. Since the dragon cannot go after and get the child... The dragon goes after what's dearest to the child. He goes after the woman. Remember, the woman is the church. It's the children of God. And so the first application here is we need to be alert. Friends, this is not peacetime. This is wartime. And the enemy wants to take you out. And we need to be alert. We also need to be confident, though, because God protects his people in the wilderness. Look at verses 6 and 14. Let me try to explain this briefly. The woman, again, who's the church, is taken to the wilderness. And you get these odd numbers, 1,260, and then a time, times, and half time. What does that mean? Very simply, it means the time between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. In other words, it's now. We are in the wilderness. And how is the wilderness characterized? It's characterized by war. That's the bad news. The good news, verses 6 and 14 again, is that God defends us. And he cares for us. And he nourishes us, his church, in the wilderness. He's the defender. And so we can take, remember all those psalms that talk about taking a mighty fortress as our God? taking refuge in God in the midst of the war. You see, we can be confident because God does not leave us in the war. Can you imagine, think about the original audience who were being persecuted terribly because they followed Jesus. Can you imagine what comfort this would have been to them that God would nourish them in the wilderness and care for them in the midst of the battle? Lastly, the tactics. What are the tactics of the war? How does dragon the, the dragon fight? We're going to look at how the dragon fights and then how we fight. The dragon fights, look at verse 9. The devil and Satan are called the deceiver of the whole world. One of the main tactics of Satan is deceit. Friends, the devil's not going to show up on your front door with horns and a pitchfork and say, worship me. That's not how he works. He deceives. Remember the gospel of John. So John in his gospel, in John chapter 8, 44, says what? Satan is the father of lies. And so what does that look like in your life? Well, let's think about the first temptation and the way the serpent tempted Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. What did they do? He went after and got them to question. He deceived them by getting them to question the goodness of God. 
Is that not how he often ta- attacks us as well? You look at your life. And you look at what's going on in your life. And you have this thought. God doesn't care about me. That's why my circumstances are so bad. That's why things will never go right in my life. It's because God doesn't like me. God doesn't care. He doesn't want me to be happy. You've been duped. Or maybe it's in the moment of temptation. And in the moment of temptation, here's what comes flooding into your mind, does it not? This is not that big a deal. I mean, come on, one time? Or this is not going to hurt anybody? Or we really love each other? Or no one will ever find out about what I'm about to, I'm about to do? Do you see it? You're being duped. Or maybe it looks like you getting up and you finally got that time to read your Bible and to pray and to calm down before God and to be quiet and still. And the moment you sit down, you get a few verses in and all of a sudden what comes flooding into your heart is all of the things that you've got to do. And you get overwhelmed by your, by your to-do list, so overwhelmed that you'll say, I don't have time for this. I gotta, I'll come back to the word in prayer. And you never do. You've been duped. Not only does he attack by deceit, but he also attacks by accusing. Did you pick up on verse 10? He's the accuser, and he accuses us day and night. And you know what this looks like, don't you? I think we're all well equated with being accused. Look what you've done. You call yourself a Christian? Are you really going to stand there And think about sharing Jesus and the love of Christ with your co-worker or neighbor when you and I know how you just talked about her 15 minutes ago. You're a terrible example. God can never use you. Does that sound familiar? Or are you really going to show up at church on Sunday morning and walk in with your Bible and hold it and act like you've got it all together when you and I know exactly what you did Friday night? Are you really going to go to worship? Or maybe it gets more personal. You're a nobody. No one wants anything to do with you. These voices sound familiar? Or you're a terrible pastor. Or you're a terrible mother. Or you're a terrible father. Or you're a terrible friend. Does this sound familiar? Or you're a terrible daughter or son. The accusations, friends, are very personal and hurtful and powerful. And so we're in a war. In this war, not only are we just supposed to take fire, we got to give fire, don't we? And so how do we fight back? What are our weapons in closing? Verse 11. How do we fight deceit? Again, notice verse 11. They conquered him. The battle is not up for grabs. The battle has been won. We can fight with confidence. So how do we fight deception? Look at verse 11, the word of their testimonies. Remember Ephesians 6, you should go read it this afternoon. It's in context, the apostle Paul, spiritual warfare, put on the full armor of God. And he says, we have an offensive weapon and it's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God. And so we fight Satan with truth. That's how you fight the deceit. And think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He's in the wilderness. And he's being 
attacked by Satan and remember how he responds every step of the way from Satan's attack? Scripture. He quotes Scripture. Every time Jesus was being pressed by life, Scripture and the Word of God oozed out of him. And so, friends, we've got to immerse ourselves in this book. We've got to know this book. We've got to read this book and study it and memorize it and hear it preached. Why? Because we, how can you know deceit and spot deceit if you don't know the truth? Because it's knowing the scriptures that we're able to combat the lies of Satan. For example, here's how it looks. God doesn't care about you. Oh, yes, he does. Matthew chapter 5. You see the birds of the air and you see the lilies of the field. If God clothes them and feeds them, how much more does he care for me and take care of me as his child? God knows that a hair cannot fall from my head without him knowing it. And friends, this is not go read your Bible because that's what good Christians do. No, no, no. This is you're in a war. And if you don't have a weapon, then you're not going to make it. If you don't have a weapon to fight the word, to fight and expose the deceit and lies of Satan. Lastly, what about accusation? How do we fight accusation when Satan accuses us? Look at verse 11 again. I love this. Through the blood of the lamb. That's how you fight accusation. When the accuser comes and says, how can you call yourself a Christian after what you've done? And, and you are unworthy. Well, you say, no, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. And because I'm covered in the blood of Jesus, you don't know the half of it. And I'm not proud of my sin, and I've got a lot, a lot of work to do, but back off. Because I have the blood of the Lamb. I have Jesus who covers me. And Jesus came into the world not to save the righteous, but to save sinners like me. You see that? Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you see these accusations, when they get filtered through the gospel, actually lead you to worship. Because you're able to see your sin and say, yes, I've got a lot of sin, but I've also got a big Savior. And so rather than your accusations driving you into a pit of guilt and shame, if you fight with the blood of the Lamb, it actually drives you to worship because you see that God's grace is greater and bigger than all of your sin. Friends, The accusations of the enemy are loud. But friends, the blood of the lamb screams louder. If you are a Christian this morning, you are in a war. And if you're going to fight and you're going to survive this war, then you must be armed with the word of testimony that we find in the Bible. And you must stand up under the blood of the Lamb. That is our only hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you for protecting us and for nurturing and caring for us in the wilderness. Give us a hunger this morning for the word. Some of us have grown up around this and it bores us. And so would you give us a renewed energy and passion for the scripture so that we might be able to spot the lies of Satan. And I pray for those who maybe are feeling the anguish of accusations that are constantly thrown at them. Would you convince us that our debts have been completely paid and that we are righteous and we are cherished as your child? Help us to believe that by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. As we